We're looking at the story of creation, especially the story of God creating Adam and Eve, because here we find what we were created for. We also find how marriage and family come into the picture. We discover that marriage and family was there before sin ever came into the world. Last Sunday, we looked at culture and everything that culture thinks about, about marriage, family, men, women, children. And it was depressing, wasn't it? It was like one negative thing after another negative thing. It gives you a completely different worldview of what the Bible portrays. There's a deep sense of hopelessness out there. A couple of years ago, Newsweek came out with an entire magazine on the topic of marriage and family. One of the articles that were written in the magazine was an article called I Don't. Basically, it goes through why we, don't get, why we shouldn't get married, why we don't need to get married, and how marriage is awful. It's a very pessimistic view of the entire institution of marriage. So if you look in culture, if you look in television and film, you get this idea that it's kind of a hopeless thing. I was curious this week about, forget what media and film says, well, what do people think? So I got on my Twitter account, searched marriage, and um, other than a lot of the topics of um, gay marriage, that's very predominantly a predominant topic in our topic, um, people talked about how hopeless marriage was. One woman, um, trying to be optimistic, made a comment that, I hope my first marriage will be my last marriage. And I was like, oh, that's a good thing. But then the comments that she received, it was, um, you're naive, good luck with that. Why would anyone want to be married to just one person their entire life? This is what's going on in culture. It feels like everything is broken, nothing ever works, everyone always breaks up, it never lasts. Culture is screaming and it's screaming at us loudly. It's portraying marriage and family however way they want it, as if they invented it. And in contrast to that, this morning we're gonna take some time to quiet down and muffle out the screaming and the noises of culture and look at what God has to say. For most of you, the story that I read is a very familiar story. Even if you know the story by heart, let me encourage you to kind of step back this morning and look at it with a fresh set of eyes. This is a story of God creating, especially creating male and female and creating marriage. And I want you to take a fresh look at this passage, examine the passage, and you'll find some very shocking details that are in the story. And I want to examine this morning what we're created for. This is a story of creation. First of all, our text says that we are created for God. If you begin at verse 4 and you start reading, the first thing that you notice is that you were created for God. The entire first chapter of Genesis is speaking of God creating the world into existence. Chapter 2 is God speaking into existence and even getting his hands dirty. He gets into the mud, gets into the dirt, and he creates humanity. The first chapter is all about God. This is because the entire Bible is about God. Your life is about God. The Bible is about God. The idea that God created you for himself is foundational for you today. This applies to you whether you're married or single, a parent or doesn't have kids, whether you're male, you're female, whether you're a diehard iPhone person or an Android person, a vegan, a vegetarian, or you love your meat, it doesn't matter. You are created for God. You are created for His glory. See, this is the ultimate def definition of value, significance, and dignity. Unless you believe the concept that you are created for God, which culture also goes against today, you have a worldview that's destructive. William Craig is a theologian. He said the following, Who am I? We ask. Why am I here? Where did I come from? These are questions of worldview. Since the Enlightenment, man has attempted to answer these three questions without any reference to God. But the answers that come back are not exhilarating, but dark and terrible. You are an accidental byproduct of nature, you are told. You are a result of time, plus matter, plus chance. There is no reason for your existence. All you face is death. Modern man thought that if he can get rid of God, he will be free from all that is repressive and all that stifles him. Instead, he discovered that in killing God, he's actually killed himself. Because if there is no God, man's life is absurd. Apart from God, mankind is a doomed race in a dying universe. Because the human race will eventually cease to exist, it makes no difference at all if it ever did exist. Mankind, thus, is no more significant than a swarm of mosquitoes 
were a barnyard of pigs, for their end is all the same. The same blind cosmic process that coughed, up, coughed him up in the first place will eventually swallow him up again. That's a pretty accurate description of what happens when you take God out of the equation. Without understanding the fundamental foundational concept that God created you for himself and made you, you fall into a worldview that's destructive. Look at verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. For in the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. What we have going on here is chapter 1 is this wide-angle lens of the entire creation story. You get the entire story in the synopsis. And then you get to chapter 2, and he zooms in onto day 6 and says, well, here's the details of what happened on day 6. Day 6, I come in and I create with my hands. The two chapters are pictures of two complete different views of God. The same God. One, chapter one, is the transcendent view of God. God outside of time, outside of space, outside of created matter. He makes it, forms it, creates it, separate from us. But in chapter two, you see God stooping down, forming man, creating. You see the closeness of God. God involved. God actively there, caring. He didn't just create it and leave it and let it go. He's actually very involved, very interested in our lives, very interested in what's going on. Mankind is the pinnacle of his creation. Everything else he speaks into being, but mankind, he takes time. He takes energy. He's involved in details and forming it. He's the only one that's created in the image of God himself. Verse 5, when no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for God had not caused it to rain in the land. And there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. The word formed, there, formed is a craftsman's term. It's the idea of deliberately working with your hands, kind of like a potter making something. God picks man out of the ground that he, and out of the dirt that he creates and breathes into him the breath of life, and he becomes a living creature. The implications of this is startling. This implies that we are made for something greater than, some, than what we just see, feel, taste, touch, or hear. It means that we are created for something completely outside of the realm of what we live in. C.S. Lewis said that if I look around the world that God has created and I find myself a desire, I find my, in myself a desire to experience something that this world cannot satisfy, the only logical conclusion there is is that I was made for something other than this world. I was made for something outside of this. That's what we find in chapter 2. God has created you. God has formed you. God has shaped you for his glory. See, I understand for most people, that's not what you think about when you think about Christianity. When pe most people say, what's a Christian? You, you list it by the things of what you do or you don't do. I go to church. I try to be moral. I pray. I do the right things. I try to be nice to my neighbors. I give my tithes. I don't do certain things. I'm different from the world. That's what most people think when they think about Christianity. However, when the Bible begins to describe what faith is like, it begins with a relationship with the Father. If you don't center your life on Jesus, who he is, what he's done, and his kingdom, and what his righteousness, and what he teaches, and instead you center your life on yourself and live for your own self instead of Jesus, you'll find yourself destroying the very things that you want. If you know Jesus and love Jesus, you have to center your life on Jesus. This is such a simple concept, isn't it? But this is where life starts. We're made to have a relationship with God. So let me ask you, how is your relationship with God? I'm not just talking about how often you come to church. I'm not talking about how much you're plugged into mission or community group, how often you do your religious duties. How is your relationship with God? This is what you're made for. Jesus died to put you into a relationship with him. All the other things of your life flow out of that. If your relationship with God is going well, everything else begins to flow. How is your relationship with God? As mundane as it sounds, I can tell you from my own life, when I, am, when I am not consistently in God's word, when I'm not consistently studying God's word for relationship, for intimacy, for communion with God, not for trying to prepare a message, not for doing my religious duties, but when I'm not doing, spending time with God just so I can be with him, I find that my energy, my passion for Jesus is often zapped. It's not there. I am made for God. I am created for God. 
in marriage, which is our topic, the most important relationship that you can have is your relationship with God. The closer that two people grow in their relationship with God and they are married together, the closer they become to one another. It's absolutely vital for that. Verse 8, God creates a garden. He goes to describe everything about the garden, the rivers, all the things that he has made. And he puts Adam into the garden. And Adam's trying to figure out what's going on. Verse 15, we see that God took him and put him in the garden to work and to keep it. We see here that God gives man responsibility. You are created by God to have relationship with him, but you're also created to work and to make something out of the world. God made you to have an impact on the culture and the world that he has made. God didn't say, Adam, here's the garden I created. Now don't screw it up. Don't do anything. Just sit there. Don't mess up what I created. God said, no, take what I've created. Use it. Take it. Cultivate it. Make it more beautiful. Work in it. He made us for himself and for his glory. Make much of him by reflecting him in this world. But he also made us to work. And one of the primary ways you do that is by being creative, designing, planning, being like Christ. Look at verse 16. God commands the man, you can eat anything of the garden, but don't eat of this one tree. Don't eat of this tree or you will die. So now God gives commands. He tells him what he needs to do and how he's supposed to follow him. Eat everything except this one tree. Because if you do that, you break your relationship with God. The relationship, and when they do eventually eat the tree, the relationship was broken. He loses his relationship with fellow beings. He loses his relationship with God. He loses his relationship with the creation that God has made. Everything becomes broken. Eventually, he would die. Listen, man wasn't created to die. He was created to live forever. But because of sin, because of him disobeying God, death enters the world. See, we're created for a relationship with God, not only to reflect him, but we're also created to obey him. That's why Solomon, at the end of his writings in the book of Ecclesiastes, says, at the end of all of these things, fear God and keep his commandments. This is what God wants. Now, for culture, that sounds like a terrible thing, right? Obey God. Do what God wants you to do. But the reality is, it's not a bad thing at all. This is a great thing. God's given you commands for you to follow for your own good. Deuteronomy 10, God tells his people, fear the Lord your God, serve him with all your heart, your soul, your mind, keep his commandments, which I've commanded you for your good, for your good. See, this is where life must begin, by seeing that you were created for God, seeing that you were created to worship him, seeing that you were created to glorify him, seeing you were created to make much of him, to be in a relationship with him, to love him, to reflect his nature, to obey him. This is foundational. It's foundational for all of life and all that you do. Our text continues to say that we're also created for relationships. We're created for God. We're also created for relationships. This is the one verse I want you to draw your attention to, verse 18. God says, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. I don't know if you ever thought about that. That's probably one of the most shocking statements in the Bible, in the context in which it is in. It's not good for man to be alone. Think about it. God will look around at chapter 1 and say everything's good. And at the end of chapter 1, he says everything's very good. And he looks at man and he sends him off to do his work. He sees him walking all by himself and realizes there's something here that doesn't reflect God's grace. It's something here that doesn't reflect God's glory. Something's not right. There's no sin in the world yet, right? It's perfect. But he says there's an incompleteness here. There's something incomplete about man being alone. God saw that even before the fall, before sin, man was not happy. Why? Because we're created in the image of God. We're reflecting God. And think about God. God is in community, is he not? In Trinity. He's got the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. He's always in community. And us being created in the image of God, we are called for community. And God looks at man walking all alone with all of these other animals and he says they're incomplete. Think about this. Think about the implication of this statement. Adam is in paradise, and he's lonely. Let me remind you what he has in the garden already. He's got great food. He's got creative beauty. He's got creative power. He's got the perfect climate. He's got perfect health. He's got the perfect prayer life. There's no sin in the world. He's got perfect relationship with God, and he's still unhappy. He's still lonely. 
He still needs human relationship. You see what that means? God made us with such a deep need for relationship that not even paradise could satisfy that. Not even a perfect prayer life could satisfy that. This might shock you, but think about this. God made us need other people so much that not even he himself could satisfy us by himself. God made us need other people. And he says it's not good for man to be alone. He needs other human beings. Think about it. None of you want to go on a vacation alone. Who wants to go to an island and be there by himself and know no one? Who wants to go to a movie alone? Which of you want to go to dinner alone? You want to be with other people. We are created for relationships. Think about the implications of that. The success-driven, consumeristic culture in which we live in says that if you want the Garden of Eden, if you want paradise, if you want a life of power, possessions, fame, beauty, pleasure, wealth, if you want a life of great career, great popularity, if you want a couple of homes, if you want a couple of cars, if you want success, if you want the garden life, if you want paradise, if you want that, culture says put relationships on the back burner, ignore them, neglect them, burn all of those things that are important to you, could be consumed with your personal career, could be consumed with success to the neglect of any relationship around you. And you realize that you get the opposite of everything that you're long for. Culture tells you that if you want to be successful, you have to move around to get ahead. That means you don't have any stable relationships at all. And you've got to put in so many hours at your job that you neglect your family at home because you keep working and you keep working. You want the garden life. Relationships have to be the least important thing in your life. And what you find here is that before even sin entered the world, the first priority has to be relationships. Genesis is saying that not even the garden, the perfect place, was enough for mankind. Paradise was in paradise without relationships. Adam had all the power, all the pleasure, all the beauty, and he was still lonely. The implication is simple. Don't try to build a life that doesn't have a personal relationship as a priority. Don't try to build your life that doesn't have personal relationships as priority. It didn't work in paradise, and it will not work today. You need God first, you need community and relationships second, and you need both of those things. Second thing you see is you can't know God or grow in his image or likeness without community. God's a triune God, and you're called to be like him. You can't know him or the way he wants you to know him without being in community or connected with other people. You want to be more like him? You want to reflect him in your life? You want to be made in his image? You want to have his wisdom, his courage, his love, his power, his joy? You want all of those things? The implication is you can't grow into the image of someone who's not just a singular person, but he's an us, father, son, and spirit. You can't do that by yourself. He's in community with the Trinity, and he's made you for community. You can't expect to grow into the image of God all by yourself. See, that's why we push missional communities here. It's not because we're giving you another church thing to do. It's because we want you to grow in the image of Christ. And you do that in the context of community. A lot of you guys will come to church and then go home. And you're simply attending church. But no one knows what's going on in your life. No one knows the struggles that you're going through. No one knows the difficulties you're going through. No one knows how to pray for you. No one knows how to encourage you. No one knows how to lift you up. No one knows how to push you to be more like Jesus. And you can't do that by simply coming and leaving. This is why community is so important. Listen, work is going to be there. Your priorities are going to be there. But if you neglect relationship, if you neglect the importance of being in community, You're not going to reflect Jesus the way he wants you to reflect him. You're created for God. You're created for relationship. Third, you're created for marriage. Notice, God didn't create Adam a roommate. He didn't create Adam a friend. He didn't create for Adam a man. He didn't create Adam for Adam another woman. He created for Adam a wife. This leads to the last point. You are created for marriage. I know immediately exceptions come to your mind. I know such and such person who's not married, and they're fine. But hear me out. Let's look at what the text says. There is no other conclusion that you can come 
from this chapter other than this. If the Bible ended at Genesis 2, that's all we had, Genesis 1 and 2, and it ends with the story that God created man and brought, and brought the woman to the man, you have to conclude that God was going to continue to make male and female and bring them together in marriage. Look at how the chapter ends. Verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. If you conclude that this is how the chapter ends, this is what God has made them for. This was the original design. Even after the fall, virtually everyone was married. It wasn't until the time of Jesus that you have what you've got modeled today, what we call the single life. Jesus never got married, but it wasn't part of his mission. He came to give his life as a ransom for many and seek and save the lost. Marriage wasn't part of that. We see the apostle Paul foregoing marriage to spread the gospel around the globe. His life, his daily risks, his constant travel for the sake of the gospel was not conducive for marriage, so he never got married. And we know that of the disciples that we know, most of them were married or they were killed before they got married. What's my point? It is that God designed the majority of human beings to get married. It's very rare not to be married. And since I don't hear many of you telling me that you want to go to Saudi Arabia or China to be missionaries or to give your life for the sake of the gospel, for the mission of the gospel, I can only deduce that God wants you to be married. This is especially true for you guys. If you look at the passage, notice you are responsible for leaving your mama and your papa and to go find a wife. It's not the girl's job to find you. It's your responsibility. She's kind of waiting for you. A lot of guys need to repent of their selfishness and their excuses for not being married, for sitting at home and playing video games. You have bad excuses for not being married. Go back to your text, verse 19, before I get in trouble. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Notice, Adam is assuming that God's going to give him a helper. He's presuming that, assuming that he's going to be there. The animals that God created, God parades before him. Adam begins to name them, but he has this deep sense of lack or vacancy that in his own life. He gives Adam responsibility to name all of these animals, because he wants Adam to be creative like God is. Make something out of nothing. Give names to something that never had a name before. And out of this exercise, it begins to dawn on Adam, there was no other creature in the garden that shared Adam's image. He knew he wasn't just a glorified animal. He knew that he was the only image bearer of God. He understood that right from the beginning. But there was no, no one to share that with him. Verse 21, so God causes him to fall into a deep sleep. And while he slept, he takes one of his ribs, closes it up with the flesh. And, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Basically, the scene is this. The last of the animals are leaving after Adam has given them a new name. Man turns around with sorrow in his eyes. God tells Adam, hey, why don't you take a nap? And he falls asleep. And while he's sleeping, God makes a woman. And she's gorgeous. Uniquely suited just for Adam. God tells her to follow him and leads her to Adam. He wakes Adam up out of his sleep and tells him, listen, I've got one more created being and I want you to give this a name. And Adam looks and he says, this at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. You don't get this in the English, but, in, but Adam is pretty thrilled right now. He's pretty excited. In fact, what he actually says is poetry. The first recorded words in the human language it's poetic. Yep. Our great, great, great grandfather puts a lot, of our, a lot of us guys to shame. He sees the woman and he actually breaks into poem. He doesn't stutter. He doesn't stumble. He gets poetic. He puts us to shame. Verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. They were one. They become one flesh. God's saying that human halves... Human being, the human machine was two halves, male and female, and they were combined into, in pairs. Not simply on a sexual level, even though that's a part, but totally combined on a spiritual and an emotional level. You're supposed to be one flesh. This is what God made them to be. 
There's supposed to be one on every level. See, this is one of the many problems with sex outside of marriage. You're attempting to isolate one type of union, sex, from other kinds of union that God has created for you. C.S. Lewis says you're tasting something good, but you're not digesting it. This also speaks to the area of divorce. Think about it. If God has made you one, when you divorce, you're like surgically trying to cut up two living parts. They've become one because God has made them one. It's not the same thing as dissolving a business partnership. It's not the same thing as leaving your home for college. It's not the same thing as graduating college and never stepping foot on campus again. Divorce is difficult because God has made you in a way that you are to unite on every level. You're not just an animal. It has more to do with than sexual union. It's a spiritual union, an emotional union. And God brings the two of you together in every way. So God made them to be together, and this is the way it's supposed to be. Let me close by noting a few things, speaking to husbands and speaking to wives. From our text to you guys, we are created to be laborers, lovers, and leaders. Guys, laborers, lovers, leaders. If you ask what you're supposed to be as a man or a husband, laborers, lovers, leaders. Verse 15 says that they are to work and to keep. The job of all men is to work. This was true even before the fall. Now, some of you guys try to blame the women for us having to work, and that's not the reality. Work became hard after the fall because the woman gave us the apple, but um, but we were still supposed to work before the fall, right? Um, We were called to work. Some of you think that work is a result of the fall, but this is how God made you. Another way of saying this is God made you a gardener and a guardian. Man is to cultivate. He's supposed to cultivate the garden. He's supposed to make something out of, the wor- out of the world through labor. He's supposed to be a guardian to it, maintain the security of the garden and the culture that he, makes, uh, that he makes. If you think about one who cultivates, think about it. It is one who tries to create the most fertile conditions for something to survive and thrive. It requires weeding, taking things that don't belong there, taking things that would kill the garden taking them out, taking things that would choke the fruit. It requires time, practice, familiarity with the plants and where they belong. You can see the connection there between what a husband is supposed to be to a wife, don't you? This is what you're called to be as men. This is Adam's responsibility, and it was preparation not just for what he was supposed to do with the Garden of Eden, but what he was supposed to do with his wife. We are are supposed to create an environment of growth and be familiar more and more with your wife. This is why first Peter, Peter would write, study your wife, learn your wife, get to know her, be fascinated by her, and you never grow old. You never get tired of it. Study her. Also in this passage, we see issues of leadership. Adam is supposed to have authority and name the creatures and even name his wife. He's the head of the home. He's created first in the story. He's supposed to be the one that is leaving his home and cleaving to his wife. This passage says that a man shall leave his father and mother so he can grow up and become a man, work and govern his life before he's supposed to take care of someone else. You're supposed to assume your responsibilities as a man. When you do that, then you're qualified to go pursue a woman for marriage, a woman who knows and loves Jesus. You don't just sit in your basement Oh, we don't have basements here. We don't just sit in your family room and play your video games and ask your mama to find you a wife. You're supposed to take responsibility. Be a man. Take ownership. In our culture, the whole process is completely inverted. And subsequently, it's created all sorts of problems. And this is why the world is broken. Young men continue to live at home, never getting a job, never taking responsibility, never growing up, freeloading off their parents. They're content of doing nothing, play video games, chase any woman that will give them attention, but never willing to commit to any of them or take care of them. They're content with having sex with women, but have no desire to become their guardian or gardener in the relationship. They use birth control to prevent pregnancy and abortion to murder their, murder their child if necessary. They become fools because they believe children are a burden and not a blessing. That's what culture teaches. You're to be men that labor, love, and lead. You single guys, you need to realize that when you get to the altar and you say, I do, nothing magically happens to you, and now you're transformed into a super husband. 
If you are not taking leadership now, you're not going to take leadership when you get married. If you don't take responsibility now, you will not do it when you get married. Nothing supernatural happens the moment you say, I do. It needs to happen way before you walk down the aisle. You need to start cultivating, practicing, practicing these things while you're single. So how are you biblically loving the women around you? How are you taking care of them? How are you cultivating an environment for their growth? How are you leading and modeling what Jesus' life is to them? This is your responsibility even now as singles. What about the wives? There's not a lot here, but let me point out two things. One, you are to help, and two, you are to honor. God says the wife was created as a helper fit for him. The helper is not talking about domestic help. She wasn't made to do the dishes, make your bed, take out your trash, change your diapers, and wash your clothes. That's not what you have a wife for. Adam could have managed those things on his own. Hopefully you guys can manage those things on your own. She was there to help him in carrying out the mission of the human race that God had given them. What did God tell them to do? Be fruitful, multiply, let my glory spread through the earth. They are supposed to be a family, have kids, let their kids have kids, leave a legacy, pass that legacy on. That's what the mandate of scripture was. She's a helper. She's supposed to supply strength in the area to the person that's being helped. As a helper, you're a helper where your husband is lacking. She's a helper like God is a helper. God is described often in the Bible as a helper, is he not? It's the very same principle. She has to find the areas that he is weak in and help in those areas. See, this is a good question for you wives. Do you know your husband's weaknesses? Do you know the area that he is weak at? Do you know where he's weak at? And do you go to seek and help him in those areas? Or do you nag him about your weaknesses, about his weaknesses? Do you constantly remind him how weak he is? Or do you go and help him in the areas that he struggles in? Truth be known, your husband is weak in many areas. And you guys, if you don't know that, you need to wake up and smell the coffee because you're weak in many areas. Just ask your wives. They'll tell you a good list. She's there to help you with that. Just as a man, by virtue of his manhood, is supposed to lead for God, lead for God, a woman, by virtue of her womanhood, is supposed to help for God. When a woman is helping, she's being like Jesus. When a man is leading, he is being like Jesus. So ladies, are you helping your husband on the mission that God has put in front of you guys? To call to do it together. How are you, those of you who are not married, serving and fulfilling the design now of being a helper and serving in that capacity? Again, nothing changes at the altar. You don't become super wife the moment you say, I do. How are you doing it now if you're single? You're made for God. You're made for relationship. You're made for marriage. This was the original design. And we all know that sin screwed this up, didn't it? It messed it completely up. And we'll look at this next week. We'll look at the fall and how this has destroyed society and it's destroyed marriages. We'll... But you can't enter in, maintain, or thrive in any of these relationships apart from grace. You can't at all. In this marriage relationship, God had a plan in mind. There's a passage in Ephesians 5. Paul quotes his exact same passage in Genesis 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the mystery is profound, for I'm saying that it refers to Christ and his bride, the church. What's Paul saying? He's saying that when God made marriage, when he made male and female, when he created them, he made them as a future picture of the gospel. Your marriage is supposed to display the gospel. He's saying that he had the gospel in mind when he came up with the institution of the marriage. It was God's plan from the very beginning. Marriage, by God's design, was to reflect that very thing, Christ loving the church. This is why Christ tells you guys, love your wives as I loved you. How did he love you? He was willing to die for you. This is exactly what happened. Thousands of years after this was written, Jesus would leave his father. He'd come down to this jacked up, messed up place called earth with all of its sin, with all of its brokenness. And he would go to the cross and he would do more than just leave his father. He was abandoned. He was separated from his father. He didn't just leave and come get married to you. 
but he actually was separated from his father. Why did this happen? Because he became sin for you. He took on the very penalty of sin that is broken in this world and broken everything around us and has caused all of the injustice and brokenness in this world. He takes all of that on his own body, on the cross, and he dies in your place so that he can then take you and cleanse you as his bride. He can put you in all white as if you had never sinned before and bring you to himself and bring you into relationship with him now and forever. He leaves his father and was separated and abandoned in that sense. His father turns his face toward him, away from him. The Bible says that if you're a follower of Jesus and you know him and love him, he has committed himself to you, that he will never leave you, that he will never forsake you, that he will never divorce you. Some of you have gone through that. Some of you have been in the midst of painful, agonizing divorces. Some of you felt it personally. Some of you have friends and family that have felt it. But you need to understand that when Jesus married you, when he made you his bride, he says he'll never divorce you. I'll never separate myself from you. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. What God has joined together, God will never separate. This is the gospel. Your marriage is supposed to reflect Jesus, your marriage is supposed to reflect the truth of the gospel. This morning as we come to the table, we recognize that we don't do this on our own, that we don't have our own gifts or our own abilities to make our marriages thrive. We don't have our own supernatural abilities to stay pure and holy as singles, but we do it because of the grace and mercy of God. It is his grace that enables us to be laborers, lovers, and leaders, to be representatives of Jesus to our wives, to be representative of Jesus to our children, to be representative of Jesus to our community. It is his grace that enables you women to be helpers, to be people that support and encourage one another. It is his grace, because oftentimes the person you're helping doesn't deserve help but he enables you and empowers you to do it. So you live every week, every day by the grace of God. And the table reminds us on a weekly basis that everything we do, everything we are, is not because of our ability or of our strength, but is because Christ enables us because of what he did on the cross. So as we come to the table this morning, we recognize that our marriages are strong, not because of us, but because of Jesus. We recognize that it's not in ourselves that we put our confidence, but we put our confidence in Jesus. That we are jacked up, messed up sinners that would screw this whole thing up on our own. But because of his grace, because he was willing to die on the cross, restore relationship to us, that he would send his Holy Spirit inside of us to lead us and guide us, that we can have marriages that honor Jesus, that we can be men that God has called us to be, that we could be women that God has called us to be. This is what you were created for. You were created for God. We're created for one another. We're created for marriage.